What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Nicholas. That is Noah at FB God on Twitter. This is Big Dogs Gotta Eat BDG Fantasy Football. Every Tuesday, Noah comes on here and joins me. We are live five videos a week. Today, we're going to be talking about the top value plays at every single position. So we're going to run through quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, tight ends, and talk about our best, our favorite value plays. Now, value plays are a little bit more boring. They're usually guys with a, a better floor. They're guys that you'll get later on in drafts that will support your team. Maybe you missed on a position, running backs or wide receivers or something. And all you need to do is put up some points in those positions. Um, and they don't have high bust potential. So you can kind of depend on them. They're not going to be exciting. They're not going to be league winners. But these guys are important. They can kind of play a staple, especially if you're in a larger league, 12 team, 14 team league. Not everybody you draft is going to be a top 12 or top 15 player at each position. So these value videos are extremely important to you guys. So make sure you all pay attention. Make sure you tuck your shirts in. Make sure you stop yelling. Make sure you follow both of us on Twitter. And make sure that if you enjoy the video, you hit that thumbs up button down below and you subscribe to the channel if you are new. What's cracking, Noah? How are we doing? We're doing well. Just trying to help the community. We got some guys going like the 10th and later rounds that could really – I mean, a few guys might have league-winning potential. We're going to get into those and just, you know, guys that you might not expect that could have big roles and guys that we've seen thus far in the preseason produce. So, Yeah, it's almost like uh, value plays are disrespected. Like I would call this the disrespectful picks of 2019, but I don't think it would play well <laughs> – in SEO. And I think this, the view count would plummet for this video and it is clickbait season. So make sure you click that thumbs up button and we'll get into some content after the intro. All right, so we're going to start at the top of your roster, and that is the quarterback position. Before we do that, though, I want to do one draft guide giveaway question. All you got to do is answer this question in the comments and hit that thumbs up down below, and you will automatically be entered. I want to know who your single favorite value pick in fantasy football is this year. I don't care what position it is. I don't care what team. I don't even have criteria for what exactly stands for value, but if you put some bullshit like Aaron Jones or something down below, you're probably going to be disqualified. So drop your favorite value pick of the year and you're automatically answered to win a draft guide we will announce it on next tuesday's video which you probably already did your fantasy draft but we'll figure something else out to give you noah let's talk quarterbacks who do we got first off we got matt stafford and i know he's not really like an interesting player to get and i was gonna go i was gonna kind of like pivot to lamar jackson but he's been flying up the rankings and same with the guy like Dak prescott and those are guys who have that rushing floor that's gonna probably give you like a top 12 qb this season but i think matt stafford's being slept on just because of how he ended last year right you look at the weapons that he lost. Not only did Marvin Jones and Carrion Johnson go down to knee injuries, um, Golden Tate, his safety blanket for like the past three or four years, was traded halfway through the season. And you can see that through the splits I'm going to put on the screen right now. Um, I did the splits with him about Carrion Johnson because after Carrion Johnson went down, he had nothing else because Marvin Jones is already out and Golden Tate was out. He was eight points per game worse without like all three of those guys on the field. He was attempting less passes. He had less touchdowns. He had more or less interceptions, but that's a function of him throwing less. And I know the, the points per game with all those guys wasn't like spectacular, right? Only 20.5. Um, that's like QB 18 or something. But you look at what happened to him early in the season, right? He was reportedly playing with like a broken back for most of the year. And you're obviously not going to produce. Like we saw Carson Wentz last year take a huge decline. And he's a much younger quarterback than him because he was playing through a broken back. So I don't think you should just write off a guy who's been a top 12 quarterback in six of the eight years that he's been a starter. And he's been top 10 from 2015 to 2017. And I think to write him off just because of like a bad second half because he lost all his weapons and he was injured is kind of foolish, especially in super flex leagues when you can get this guy later than most quarterbacks and he could be like a very viable QB2 for you in those leagues. Yeah, so when you, when you talk about QB2, like a guy like, it, this is specific to the quarterback position, but when I think of value, and when you think of floor, I like those guys a lot better in Superflex because I wouldn't be drafting a guy like Stafford. I wouldn't be drafting uh, one of the guys that we talk about after Stafford um, in a one quarterback league because there's no reason to not shoot for upside. So I think a lot of this has to go with uh, two quarterbacks in Superflex leagues because you might as well draft for upside in one quarterback leagues. You could drop a guy if it doesn't work out. With Stafford, though, you're right. The, I, I think the concern, I mean, he is obviously coming off a down year and there will be a lot of recency biases involved in like his analysis and where he's getting drafted 
Um, but you have to, you know, take a step back and look. Okay, the team is good around him. You have Carrion as a very good pass catching back. You have Galladay as the one. You have Marvin Jones back as a field stretcher, as a legitimate two, one of the best wide receiver twos probably in the NFL, like top five, top ten for sure. Um, they have Danny Amendola, TJ Hawkinson. They have a good offensive line. So they have a lot of good pieces here for Detroit. The worry, I think, is just whether or not Matt Stafford will see the passing volume. That's what kind of scares me. But I still think he has a good, solid passing floor, which is what I look at for my second quarterback in a super flex league. But you can also get Stafford later than that. He could be like your quarterback three. And in good matchups or, you know, matchups where you think they're going to have to pass the ball a lot, he's probably a very good play. Because like you said, he scored uh, – he finished as a top 12 quarterback six of eight years. And that can't be discounted. It's not like his play has fallen off. He hasn't gotten worse as a quarterback. It was just a situational thing. Like you said, he tweaked up his back at the end of the year, and you saw – um, his numbers really dove down as soon as that happened because they kind of pulled back the reins on the volume. So I'm with Stafford. You said quarterback 24, about 175 overall. Obviously in super flex, he's still probably like an eighth or ninth round guy that you get as your quarterback three. So I like Stafford. Another guy that kind of reminds me of Stafford is Kirk Cousins of the Minnesota Vikings. Quarterback 21, 155 overall and quarterback um, in ADP overall. Now he's kind of in a similar situation where you have – uh, a new kind of scheme coming in. You have Stefanski who took over the second, um, not the second half, but the last three games, I believe it was last year. Such a small sample size for us to just rest on the fact that, you know, they ran more run plays than pass plays or whatever in that three game size, because the the tempo of the game or the score of the game is going to, ma- uh, going to factor into the pass versus run ratio to such a high degree when it's that small of a sample size. Kirk Cousins, has arguably a better um, weapons group around him than Matt Stafford does. I don't even think it's actually arguable between Dalvin Cook, Adam Thielen, Stephon Diggs. Uh, Irv Smith should be used plenty full. He, he looked really good in their um, in their first preseason – or the last preseason game, week two. Uh, by the time you guys are watching this, we film on Friday, so – or we're actually filming this on Thursday. So we will not have gone into a lot of the preseason week three games. There's, I'm sure there's a lot of takeaways from there. Uh, but Kirk Cousins is another very high-floor quarterback. The passing volume might dip a little bit. But he's still pretty much a lock for, you know, 42 to 4,400 passing yards, probably between 27 and 30 touchdowns. And you can't really ask for much more of that guy you're drafting outside of the top fucking 20 quarterbacks. Yeah, and if you look at the games where Stefanski was there and you were completely right about, like, looking at the score and taking everything into context, sure, they ran the ball a lot, but they also played Miami and Detroit, who were two terrible teams last year, and they won those games 41 to 17 and 27 to 9. So they were kind of forced to run the ball just to run the clock out. And it's not like Kirk Cousins was bad in those games. If you extrapolate that three-game sample, and I know it's a small number, but we're doing the same for the rushing. Um, If you extrapolate that to a full 16, Kirk Cousins was on pace for 32 touchdowns, and he would have had the most touchdown throws inside the 10-yard line. So it's not like they were actually, like, completely fading him. He was actually, like, extremely efficient inside the 10, inside the 20. And I think we can expect much of the same this year because, as you said, he does have, like, one of the best receivers and weapons groups in the NFL. And I just think that – for a guy who's been picked as like a top 10 quarterback each of the past two years, for him to fall into the QB 20s after putting up like the second most yards of his career, um, the most passing touchdowns of his career, I think there's just way too much value to pass up on him, especially as a QB 2. And even in single QB leagues, you look at how he starts this season, he gets Atlanta, Green Bay, and Oakland to start off. And those are three pretty terrible defenses. And even if the defenses improve, they're decent enough offenses where it's going to be a shootout. And Kirk Cousins really has top 12 upside each of those first three weeks. Yeah, and, and the other thing with Kirk, too, is, like, the biggest concern is passing volume, in my opinion. And um, when you look at, you know, you, you said over those last three games, if you pace it out, it's actually pretty good numbers. But even if the volume does dip, you could look at those years back in Washington before he came to Minnesota, and he was the quarterback five and the quarterback eight in fantasy. Those were years where he only attempted 540 pass attempts, right, which is a lot lower than he had seen in Minnesota. So if you scale it back, we've already seen him be a prolific fantasy option, fantasy quarterback with lower pass attempt volume. And that was like – that was in Washington. Like who were the weapons there that he's working with? And now – Sean Jackson, if, the GOAT. Yeah, Pierre true, Carson. Sean Jackson, Pierre – true that. They actually low-key had like yeah. – <laughs> when they were all in their prime and Jordan Reed when he was healthy. But still not, not even rivaling what they have in Minnesota right now. So lower pass attempts, obviously it's not a great thing. But when you're getting that quarterback 21, I mean there's really – there's no downside to grabbing here. So I'm, I'm with uh, I'm with Kirk Cousins. Yeah, and it's his second year on the team. I, like, kind of forgot that last year was his first time in Minnesota. So he can, like, build a full offseason of rapport with these top receivers. And we even saw it in, like, preseason week two. I know you said we haven't seen preseason week three yet because we're recording before that. But him and Adam Thielen, they wow. have such a good connection. Wow. 
it's dude, ridiculous. Thielen, like, yeah, dude, after watching that game, I'm, I'm like almost comfortable taking Thielen a lot earlier than I was prior to seeing that. And it makes me a little bit nervous for Diggs because it's like he's looking at Thielen every single throw. Um, but, yeah, that rapport looked good, and that is going to pay dividends, I think, in, in fantasy for, for both the thrower and the fucking pass catcher there. Yeah, and even that one play on the one-yard line where they, like, ran that play action, they threw it to Alexander Madison, it shows that they're not just going to run it up the gut if they have better play calls to be made on the goal line. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting offense to follow this year for sure. Next up with Matt Breida. This guy, we've been saying it for weeks, he is the best value pick you could make in fantasy football this season, bar none. Currently the RB48, I have no clue how he's not, like, in the 30s yet. I've talked about Matt Breida. We're putting out five to six videos a week, and I've talked about Matt Breida in every single one of them, I think, for the last (laughs) month straight. And now he's finally cracking single-digit rounds. Like, in best ball drafts, he's finally getting into the ninth round. Yeah, I don't see a way where he doesn't return, like, top 36 value at the very least because even in their preseason game when Jimmy Garoppolo looked horrible, Matt Breida was in there for 40% of the snaps, and he lined up out wide twice. And he's a guy that can give you chunk yardage in the passing and in the rushing game. He was, like, top 10 in yards per touch, yards per carry, yards per reception. Um, He was 11th in yards per route run. He basically does everything Tevin Coleman does just in a smaller frame. Like, Tevin Coleman isn't going to be, like, the dominant goal line back. He was never that. Even in Atlanta last year, he had less red zone carries than Ito Smith, who's, like, 5'8", 175. Maybe not that small, but, like, he's, he's not going to be dominating on the goal line. <laughs> he's not going to be dominating on the goal line. He's not going to be dominating in the passing game because, I mean, we've already seen in the preseason, Matt Breida, they want to use him in that part of the game. And even if he sees, like, 140 touches this year, I did this, like, this big fact experiment, if you want to call it that. So, Stick with me, right? So San Francisco last year, their running backs had 417 touches, not including Kyle Juszczyk, who was a fullback. 35% of, of 417 is 146. So if we project them for 146 touches on six yards per touch, that's 876 yards. Only 30 running backs hit that mark last year, and the lowest finish of those running backs was RB31. So you're really? pretty much – yeah, you're, it was Deion Lewis. So you, his yard, you said his yards per touch was 6.0 last year? Yeah. Where was that? Where did that rank in the NFL? Do you know off the top? I end? think it was seventh on the twenty seventh most touches. I'm like Rain Man right now. I don't know what's going on. This is not. You know what's my favorite part about having you on these videos on like for these Tuesdays is I don't actually have to prepare any of the big facts. I, I sit here like <laughs> I sit here like <laughs> don't bring any <laughs> or statistics to the table. I just splurt out my fucking terrible opinion. But you're there to back me up with actual facts and numbers. So this is a, this is a nice little fucking partnership. And I appreciate you putting in the work behind the scenes. We got fucking big facts. Matt Breida guaranteed running back 30 or better. No, but for real, they were splitting snaps 40 to 60 in the preseason game. And the way they were using the running backs was so significant in the passing game. They were out wide. They were There was pre-snap motion getting those guys into the slot. They were running, they were running wheel routes, which are super valuable to the running back position for fantasy. Jimmy G might be the problem. Either way, that team might be terrible as well, and that's going to lead to more passing situations. Shanahan has to be super comfortable using Breida in passing situations at this point after having him for the last couple of years. Um, there's no way that Matt Breida – Matt Breida is definitely going to surpass uh, the 140 touch mark or whatever you said last year. He's going to get 10 to 12 touches a game as a floor. There will be games where he goes off and gets a hot hand and goes for 16 or 18 touches, and those weeks he'll be a borderline you know, high-end RB2. Um, but I think at the end of the season, you're going to look back and be like, yeah, he's probably a top 25 fantasy running back that you're getting in the 10th round. Yeah, and he did that last year with like a broken ankle every other week. So, And with like more weapons in this offense, they're probably going to be a little more efficient, even if Jimmy G isn't what we like hope and expect out of him. It's just going to be a better offense, and he's going to still get the same workload he had last year, at least close to it, keep up his efficiency. There's no way he he's worse than the RB48, and that's why he's probably the best value pick you can get right now. Yeah, uh, another – goat value pick is you know it's fun I feel like we talk about a lot of the same players every week on our video I don't know what the why the topics end up going around Peyton Barber all the time but I fucking love me some Peyton Barber bro so far this preseason uh Winston's been on the field for 22 snaps Rojo has seen nine of them Peyton Barber has seen 13 of them Rojo's currently dealing with some type of knee issue the reports are saying they're looking to bring in another back for depth all did you see that picture of his knee no what it look like? It looks like the letter C. I'll put a picture on it. His knee was completely folded backwards. It was like it was, was pretty it gruesome. Located? And they're just like underplaying it. I don't know. It was like on the very first play. It was on the kickoff, and he went to go take it back, and he slipped, and his knee like buckled. I don't know. Doctor Jesse probably, Morris probably knows more than me. It probably hyperextended if it looked like it went like kind of backwards. Um, 
Yeah, either way, I mean, when you're in a running back battle, like the last thing you can afford to do is lose any sort of snaps, whether it's preseason or practice, training camp, doesn't matter. That puts you further behind in the fold. This is a new offense that they're all learning, and clearly Peyton Barber has been the starter for both games, so Bruce Arians is comfortable labeling as a starter. And we posted this on our Instagram yesterday, but Peyton Barber was top 10 in force, uh, missed tackles force last year as well as carries. Obviously, they didn't translate into a lot of yardage and production, but if we see him, I mean, he's being used in the passing game a little bit already in the preseason. He had a lot of goal line carries. I think he, he had the seventh most goal line carries of all. 12 time. goal line carries, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, like, if they use him in that capacity again, I think it was more of like a bad luck thing last year. If that improves a little bit, you know, we look at, like, touchdown rate for quarterbacks and we look at that for other positions. Looking at that from Peyton Barber's point of view, yeah, maybe it could the, – the end point could come to the fact that Peyton Barber might just suck, right? And that's, that's really what's going to happen. But if it's just a, a, a bad luck season and he gets the same number of goal line carries and actually converts, you know – 50% of them or 60% of them instead of 20% of them, you're looking at a guy who's probably going to flirt with a thousand total yards and has the potential to score, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 total touchdowns that you're getting for almost nothing. So as a value play, yeah, I like Barber because he's also a floor play. So if you miss out on a lot of running backs at the top of the draft, like you go so wide receiver and tight end heavy, and all you need to do is put like seven or eight points into your lineup each week at running back. Peyton Barber is a guy that can do that for you. Yeah, and touching on those goal line carries, I completely agree that he was kind of unlucky last year. Only 12 running backs had 12 or more goal line carries. Eight of them, or 75%, had six or more goal line touchdowns. Peyton Barber only had four. So he was like, we should expect some positive regression out of him, especially because they don't have like a running back that they trust on the goal line. I know that guy like Dare Ogbon Wale or whatever. Like, I don't know. He's yeah. looked good, but he's been running with the twos exclusively. He hasn't gotten in with Jameis Winston on the field. So I expect Peyton Barber to be their starter, especially if this like hyperextension to Rojo's knee lasts into the season. And the other yeah. thing I want to no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, the only the other thing I want to touch on is like last year he was Peyton Barber was kind of rising up ranks because he was the only guy in town and people started to realize that around draft time. And people yeah. kind of got sick of him halfway through the season because he wasn't really producing. But if you look over the last half of the season, he was on pace for 25 or 24 receptions, 1,000 yards from scrimmage, eight touchdowns. Only 15 running backs last year hit all three of those marks. So if he, if he is their lead back, which I kind of expect, in an offense that will at least be as good as they were last year, I mean, he's going to return value of like a top 24 running back and at the very least a flex play, and you're getting him as like the RB49 right now. Yeah, and just to touch on that other running back that you brought up, Dare, whatever his name is, Dar, Dare, Dare, whatever, Agabu Wale. Uh, <laughs> like, someone's going to get excited about him. At the end of the day, he's been in the league. He's an undrafted free agent. Um, he has, like, 12 to 10 less pounds on his frame than Peyton Barber does and is actually slower than Peyton Barber despite having less size on him. He's not the guy. Like, Bruce Arians has hyped up every single running back in this backfield. It's just no one – likes Peyton Barber. But like you said, over the second half of the year, he started off the year really poorly. It was like seven fantasy points and then three straight games of three fantasy points. Then over the second half of the year, like you had more than half of his games went for double digit fantasy points. Like they were all, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, six, or I don't know, five or six of the last like 12 games went for 12 and a half or 13 or more fantasy points. So again, he's a floor play. He's a value play. He's probably not going to be a league winner. But he's someone that you can that you should consider if you're very low on depth at running back and all you're going to need to do is get production. Like maybe you draft Peyton Barber and stack it with a guy like Devin Singletary or Miles Sanders who you're not expecting to give you production in the beginning of the year. Maybe Peyton Barber loses his fucking starting role by week four, week five. But if you can get, you know, 10 fantasy points out of him for the first three or four weeks and then by that time, you know, Miles Sanders is giving you 12 to 15 fantasy points you did a good job with your roster construction. That's the way to look at these kind of players. Yeah, and the other thing about uh, Peyton Barber, he could actually see an uptick in targets this year because, as you said, he's not like a bad uh, ca uh, pass catcher. And you look at Bruce Arians over his last two years with Arizona, he targeted the running back position 22% of the time both years, which is 8% higher than Tampa Bay last year. Now with Adam Humphreys gone, who kind of operated in and around the line of scrimmage, if, even if Peyton Barber isn't the third down back, if they're going to throw on first and second downs and he's out there, they're going to need a guy to rely on. And I'm not sure Chris Godwin is going to be – taking all of Adam Humphrey's looks like six yards down the field. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there's definitely targets open up and his range of outcomes is a lot higher this year than it was last year. So um, I, I think he's a great value pick. When we move to the wide receivers there. I, I have like seven that I actually have on, on a list here, but I'll let you start off with uh, one of your guys that you like. Yeah, it's Marvin Jones. And last year he did end the year with an injury, but, I'm not even sure. It wasn't an ACL tear, right? Because he didn't get, like, serious. Nah, it looked like – I don't know. Dr. Morse was saying that it was – they didn't really 
disclose what it was, but it wasn't that serious. And apparently he's back to full health. It definitely wasn't an ACL tear, but I don't know. Yeah, I feel like with him and Carrion Johnson, they just shut it down because they knew the season was kind of over. But just going on Marvin Jones, right? If you look and you pace out his numbers, and I know this isn't like a great experiment, but he's been kind of consistent. He's on pace for 62 catches, 900 yards, and nine touchdowns on 110 targets, which is basically where he's been at like the previous three seasons. His averages over those years were 60 catches, 900 yards, and six touchdowns. And I'll put the tweets on the screen for you guys to see it. And in the two games where Golden Tate went down, who's been Matthew Stafford's uh, safety blanket over the past couple of years, He was at Minnesota, at Chicago, two really tough defenses. He still accrued 15 targets and 121 yards. And those are probably the two toughest defenses he's going to face all year. And he faces them four times a season. But he's going to be a guy who's going to see seven, eight targets a game. You're getting him as the wide receiver 35. And not only is he getting volume, he's getting good, valuable volume because he's using the deep receiving game and he's using the end zone. If we look at last year and we pace out his deep targets, it would have ranked eighth. And that's, again, it's not like a bad way to extrapolate it because it's not an outlier season because the year before that, he was sixth in deep targets and he was top five in deep receptions, deep receiving yards, deep touchdowns. And I know you want to chase guys like uh, Deshaun Jackson who can bring that as well, but you're also out of Marvin Jones, you're getting actual volume in other parts of the field, not just deep touchdowns. And those chunk plays bring you a ton of value. And especially in the red zone, right? Last year, he had 11 red zone targets in just nine games. Pace out to a full 16, he would have ranked 11th. He had six inside the 10-yard line targets. Pace out to a full 16, would have ranked fourth in the league. So he's getting these deep targets. He's getting targets in the red zone. He's still going to be Matthew Stafford's number two option in this passing game. And for a guy who likes to throw the ball deep, I mean, he's, he's going to return value as the wide receiver 35 this year. And all he's ever been over the past three seasons is like a high-end wide receiver two or like a low-end wide receiver two, which is much higher than where he's being picked. Yeah, I like Jones as a value pick, too. I think, I mean, if you're buying into Stafford, then there's no reason not to buy into Marvin Jones. Some guy, I've, Sterling Shepard is a guy that I've been slowly kind of creeping up the draft board. I Once he hurt the thumb or broke the finger or whatever, if he's 100% going into the beginning of the year, he is going to return a lot of value going after pick 100. Because if you look at, okay, his rookie year, he had 105 targets. His sophomore year, 84, but in 11 games. So he was going to go way over 100 targets. Last year, 107 targets. That was all with Odell Beckham there, right? And now Golden Tate's going to miss the first four games. Shepard, as long as he is capable of catching the ball, is going to be the wide receiver one in this offense. Not going to be a good offense, but you're not going to find a lot of guys that you can have a floor of 100 targets after pick 100. Um, He hasn't been very explosive, and he hasn't really put up a ton of touchdowns. But if you're playing in a half PPR or a full PPR league, like he's going to be a great second flex play or a wide receiver three or a flex play after the wide receiver three or something. Um, doesn't again doesn't give you the touchdown upside so I'd probably stay away from him in standard but the volume is going to be there and there's not a lot of guys that you could say for sure that we've already seen it. it's three straight years of going over 100 targets at least on a per game pace so I'm, I'm with I'm with Shepard here uh, again don't like the offense but I think that Daniel Jones will be starting probably within like four to six weeks and he's looked pretty sharp on his short to intermediate throws which is where Shepard runs his route so uh, I, I kind of like Shepard as a, uh, a medium a mid to late round pick at, yeah uh, I'm pretty high on him, too, because at this point in his career, Eli Manning isn't throwing downfield. And as you said, uh, Daniel Jones has actually looked really good and really accurate getting the ball out quickly in the short and intermediate game. And I don't mind them having Golden Tate and Evan Ingram, who, like, Evan Ingram, I'd expect him to have, like, a really high dot. It's only, like, 5.6. So uh, this is me in offense. This is me throwing the ball quickly. And I really – I don't think that's too bad for uh, Sterling Shepard's upside in a PPR league where he has upside to catch, like, 65 to 70 balls, which only a handful of receivers do year in and year out, especially – you know, past round 10, where you're probably getting him right now, especially on knowing, like not knowing what's up with his thumb right now. Yeah. Um, I mean, all the reports say that he should be good to go. I, I mean, I feel like they've handled him poorly. Like they keep throwing him out there in practice and game situations to catch balls. They should have just let him rest. Like he knows the offense and he doesn't really need to practice. But if he goes into week one and he's able to be out there on the field, then I, I feel pretty confident that he's going to get pretty good volume over the first uh four weeks of the season at least, and then you'll kind of have to play it by year and see what happens with Golden Tate in the lineup. But we'll know a lot more about the New York Giants offense altogether by that point in the season. Yeah, and another receiver that could benefit from another receiver on his team going down, not to an injury but or a suspension, but to a helmet. It's Tyrell Williams, the wide receiver 54 off the board right now. Mentally down. <laughs> he he was like one of my favorite players to watch in San Diego, or in Los Angeles, rest in peace, um, because <laughs> – because he not only was used deep down the field, but he's also used in the red zone in those years when Keenan Allen got injured and they didn't have a Mike Williams type 
And you see what Oakland did to like instill confidence in like picking up Tyra Williams this offseason. They paid the guy $44 million. And in their first preseason game, or the last preseason game we just watched, he played five of the six first team snaps. He was used in one wide receiver sets. The only uh, time he was off the field was on a running play, and he was in, on the field in the red zone. So I think he's just going to be a guy that Derek Carr can throw to deep down the field. And Derek Carr isn't really known as a deep threat, but I think the addition of Antonio Brown and J.J. Nelson, like maybe they want to use him a bit more because in the past four seasons, Derek Carr has ranked top six in deep accuracy um, three times. So I think Tyrell Williams, the addition of him and the other two weapons show that they kind of want to push the ball a little bit more down the field. Um, and on top of that, the year when Hunter Henry or when uh, Keenan Allen went down and all they were left with was Hunter Henry and Antonio Gates, he proved he could be an alpha receiver. He went for 69 catches for 1,000 yards and seven touchdowns, and he was used in the red zone, and he was used in the deep game. So I don't think he's really a one-trick pony as a lot of people think he is, especially when you consider the team invested so much capital in him. Yeah, I think an underrated part of this storyline, too, is the chemistry that's building here because they have so many new pieces coming into this offense between the backfield and Josh Jacobs, but Terrell Williams, Antonio Brown. And obviously, Antonio Brown's been gone the entire summer with whatever the fuck's going on with him. But Terrell Williams has been there, and he's been getting that chemistry. And you saw it in the first preseason game. Like, Derek Carr, first fucking pass, was not afraid to just lob it up to Terrell Williams and let him go up and make a play. That's important. Those are, like, intangibles that you can't account for in the stats and in the big facts. But, like, on the field, that will translate. He might be more comfortable, and it's weird to say, but in game situations, because he's built this chemistry already with Tyrell, he might be more comfortable if both him and A.B. are running deep routes chucking it up to Tyrell because he's already seen Tyrell go up and get it for him. And he's been practicing with him and their timing is good and their chemistry is good. So I kind of like Tyrell too. He's someone that I wouldn't touch until late, late, late into the drafts only because um, I, my rule is really just to stay away from offenses that I think are going to be really shitty overall, because if he doesn't end up being like the main deep threat, he's not going to be able to make up for it in touchdowns. Whereas a guy like, you know, Mike Williams on the chargers, if he, doesn't play well if it doesn't catch a lot of passes or yards he could always go for that touchdown number because the team will put himself in, in scoring opportunities for him to you know make up for those lack of receptions and yards so that's my only kind of beef with Terrell Williams but he's a, a guy that's definitely benefiting from the wide receiver one Antonio Brown getting so much hype but possibly we, we have no idea what's going to happen with Brown he's it, it's all red flags there we have seen nothing good or heard anything good come out from camp other than seeing him on hard knocks and like seeing him fucking smile and be excited a couple times but like there's been nothing there. So um, I'm, I'm with Tyrell Williams. I probably will own him in one or two spots because we've also seen him produce at a very high level in fantasy in the NFL before. Um, so that's, that's a big factor for me when I'm looking at guys with this upside. He's not someone with hypothetical upside. He's someone that's actually legitimately shown us that he can operate as a wide receiver one and, and produce top 12, top 15 fantasy numbers. Now, one guy that I think is – hasn't gone up draft boards yet, but should be benefiting from the wide receiver in front of him, possibly dealing with a serious injury, is Michael Gallup of the Cowboys. He's not a prospect that I absolutely loved coming out of school, but he's very versatile. And you can move him around in the X, the, the flanker, the Y spot. And Amari Cooper's dealing with plantar fasciitis. And we had Dr. Morse on the channel last week talking about how painful this is. And this is an injury that scares me, especially with the reports just starting to surface this late into the offseason. It wasn't like something we heard about in May, and then they've just like very um, cautiously moved him along the offseason workouts. It's like now we're hearing, oh, he's dealing with a heel issue. He's dealing with an ankle issue. He's dealing with plantar fasciitis now. And that I think we have confirmed that that's what it actually is. And that's one of the most painful foot injuries to deal with. And it's going to be very hard for him to operate as, you know, his true raw talent upside. And with that, you know, obviously that knocks Dak down a lot. If Cooper's not operating at full health, then I'm probably not in on Dak at all this year in fantasy. But that means Gallup will get a lot of volume, and they don't really have any other – like, I don't even – who is their wide receiver three or four on their depth chart? Do you know? I think it's Randall Cobb, but that guy's never been healthy. True. Oh, yeah, Randall Cobb. Randall Cobb becomes interesting as a very late-round pick in, in best ball drafts, too. I've been scooping him a couple spots because – I don't know. I really am I'm nervous about Amari Cooper's foot. So he's kind of off my draft board, which means Michael Gallup kind of re-enters my draft board later on. Yeah, and you look at what they did in the playoffs last season. In their two playoff games, Gallup was to uh, targeted a total of 15 times. And in the final game that they played of the season, he had 119 uh, rece uh, receiving yards on six catches against the Rams. So he's not a guy that they're afraid to use. And in just his rookie year, he's kind of being leaned on in the most valuable game of their season. I completely agree, especially, you know, if Zeke sits, for the first however many games, they're not going to be pounding the rock up the middle 25 times with a combination of Mike Weber and uh, Tony Pollard. They're going to have to throw the ball. 
And if Amari Cooper is injured, Michael Gallus be the recipient of wide receiver one targets in that offense. Yeah, I mean, the vo- from the volume standpoint, even going back a few games further than what you originally mentioned, the last seven games of the season that he played in, his target totals were six, seven, nine, four, six, six, nine. So he only went under six once of those last seven games. He didn't produce much from a yardage standpoint, which is, I guess, a little bit concerning. But he had his big games. Like you said, the last game against uh, the Rams, the divisional playoffs, six for 119. He scored twice in those six games down the stretch. So it's like you saw Dak getting more comfortable with him. And that's what you like to see from a rookie receiver as the season progresses. It's like, do you start owning that wide receiver two role? Do you start like commanding to be on the field more? And that's my concern with other guys like a Traquan Smith. It's like Ted Ginn sat out for like 10 games last year. By the time Ted Ginn came back week 16, 17 in the playoffs, Ted Ginn was right back into that wide receiver two role. Like Traquan Smith did not play well enough in order to be like, no, let's get this 32-year-old wide receiver vet off the field for this young up-and-coming explosive rookie. Clearly, there was something off there with Traquan, which is what makes me nervous about a guy like that. But on the flip side, is a positive for a guy like Michael Gallup because he progressed and got better as a rookie and commanded to be on the field a little bit more, and Dak was giving him those looks. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit excited about Michael Gallup. Yeah, what are your thoughts on a guy like Marquise Goodwin? Do you think he's going to be the wide receiver one in San Francisco this year? The wide receiver one? Yeah, they're like not the re- number one receiving weapon because that's kind of George Kittle's role, but do you think he's going to be out there on like two receiver sets all the time? I mean, he was. He was out there every snap with Jimmy G. Um, I think I, I think Dante Pettis is still the one. I think it was a lot of motivation behind Kyle Shanahan saying those things and how the reports were saying he was running with the twos because he also played every snap with – Jimmy G on the field with the ones this previous weekend. It was him and Goodwin as the one and two. When they played three wide receiver sets, Jordan Matthews stepped in for the slot. So there's a lot of hype around Debo Samuel and Jalen Hurd, but we're seeing where they really are in the in the depth chart. Uh, I think that I think Pettis is going to own the wide receiver one role. I think the wide receiver two role, depending on the formation and the scheme at the time, is going to be like a revolving door. I think we'll see Samuel work his way into more of a role in this offense. I think Jalen Hurd will be out there in special situations. Goodwin will be out there, I'm sure, um, but I, I don't want any part of him in fantasy. I, even last year, like, we we knew his lengthy uh, injury history going into the year, and people still wanted him in, like, the fifth, sixth round. He had, you know, all types of lower leg injuries, concussion issues, like, fucking so many different things wrong with him, and then he just kind of proved that right again last year. So when I'm looking at him, I, I don't know. I just – I don't even really see that much upside because I don't think they're going to be, like, an explosive offense. So even if he somehow stays healthy for 16 games – like, I, I don't see him really exploding, statistically speaking. Yeah, and I heard he wants to, like, participate in the 2020 Olympics. So, I'm, I'm not sure, like, how committed he is to this team. And But the fact that they kind of, like, came out and said he's a wide receiver one, despite that fact, kind of gives me pause to take, like, any of these San Francisco wide receivers, especially because, like, half of them are rookies and half of them haven't had any good news come out about them. So, that's kind of a team I'm fading other than George Kittle and Matt Breida at this point. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way, like – you know, Jimmy G now, where where are his real weapons outside of just a tight end and a running back again? It's almost the same situation as last year. Um, if you don't have solid wide receivers that could separate on the outside, you're not really going to put up that big of numbers. So Pettis, yeah, once Pettis' ADP started rising into the seventh and sixth round for a while, I didn't take any shares of him. But in the mock draft that I filmed today for tomorrow's video, Pettis fell to me at, I think, the 809 in a 12-team league. And I was like, you know what? I haven't taken him in a while. That's where I'm willing to gamble on him because I do think that there is upside there for Pettis as opposed to a lot of the other guys in the offense. Um, but, yeah, overall, I'm not, I'm not high on, on the San Francisco 49ers offense whatsoever. Yeah, in the eighth and ninth round, you pretty much have your starting lineup all set out. So he's like a deep flyer pick that you can put on your bench and hopefully he produces because he was good last year. But um, I wouldn't call him a value pick just yet. But if Dante Pettis keeps falling down the boards, maybe I'll start taking him. But as it stands right now with drafts in a week or two, I'm not too high on him. Yeah, two, two more quick value picks I want to throw in here. I just talked about Teddy Ginn, but I also think Teddy Ginn is still the wide receiver two here in New Orleans. And like I said, when he came back the last three weeks of the season, he was seeing like five, seven, eight targets a game. When all these other receivers had 10 weeks to take over that wide receiver two role, they showed you that they were still, you know, in, enamored with Teddy Ginn as their wide receiver two. I still think he occupies that role going into 2019. So I think he's a value play. Uh, I think – Mohamed Sanu of the Falcons is also a value play. In the preseason, we've seen that he is still operating as a wide receiver too. Everyone kind of assumed that Ridley would be that guy, that he would be the wide receiver too from a snaps perspective. He is the three here. Um, He is operating as the second outside wide receiver when they go to three wide receiver sets, which is a very high percentage of the time in this dirt cutter offense. He moves, uh, Mohamed Sanu moves into the slot during those times. But when there's two wide receivers on the field, it is Mohamed Sanu, it is Julio Jones. Production-wise, 
absolutely Calvin Ridley is going to be the wide receiver two there. But Muhammad Sanu should not be off your fantasy radars late in drafts because he gives you a very nice floor that I don't think a lot of people are expecting. So I like those two wide receivers. Let's move on to tight ends. Yeah, and we're going to start with Chris Herndon. And this isn't a guy I'm going to pick, but he's a value play for pretty much the second half of the season because he's suspended for the first four weeks. But I have a player you guys can pick late in drafts to pair him uh, and play the matchups and then pick up Chris Herndon off the waivers. But just getting into what we've seen out of Chris Herndon thus far in his career and in the preseason. First off, in the preseason, he's played every single snap where Sam Darnold has been on the field, just showing he's not going to be that guy who plays 55% of the snaps. Like, you know, David Njoku last year was kind of taken out by the goal line. I think he had like an 85% snap share. But we can kind of expect Chris Herndon to be like at or around that level this year. Um, he's an athletic guy who was used in the red zone, used in That's the huge. Let me let me ask you something because the snap percentages are big takeaways from the preseason. Herndon is playing every snap with Darnold. We have OJ Howard playing every snap with Jameis Winston. Now we had the report come out today or yesterday that the OC for Pittsburgh, Randy Fishner or whatever, was saying that Vance McDonald is never going to be that every snap player. He's never going to be an every down player. And I don't know why he like came out and got it seemed like he was like frustrated about it and he was like yelling about it. But in the preseason so far, we've seen Vance McDonald be on the field for basically every snap with the ones. So that's an interesting situation. What is your takeaway from there? Do you think Vance is going to be like an every snap player? Or do you think that like this coach is kind of telling us what to expect? I mean, what we see in the preseason usually translates to what we see in the regular season. But at this point in his career, Vance McDonald's what, like 28, 29 years old? We kind of know what he is and what they used him last year as like Jesse James was on the field for as often as – Vance McDonald was and I'm not like yeah and and Jesse James isn't like a big receiving threat maybe he's like a blocking threat but I'd expect if he was going to be on the field every down this year for Vance McDonald I would expect him to have taken that role over last season so I'm not I'm not too sure that he's that the coach or the OC is lying about him not playing half the snaps but at the same time I think if he plays every snap we've seen him be injured pretty much every season he's been in the league I think him being an every down player might hurt his value just because we haven't seen him be a durable weapon um, That's the huge takeaway for tight ends. Like when you get to that tight end eight to fifteen range, like the difference between the good fantasy producers and the ones that end up flaming out are a lot of those guys end up playing forty five percent of the snaps, and that is that is like what you need to monitor throughout the preseason. Now Herndon's been playing every single snap, um, so those you know you have to make sure that the guys you're drafting, like Mark Andrews, is someone you have to cool down on dramatically because everyone loves the uh, the athleticism they love what he did last year in a limited sample size and they love the reports that came out of summer but this guy is still playing on like 40 percent of the snaps in this offense you have Nick Boyle getting in there you have Hayden Hurst getting in there with the first team so again he's not going to be a full-time player and he's never going to hit a fantasy ceiling of where you want him to hit unless he's on the field for all three downs or at least like 60 to 65 percent of the plays where he's getting most of the receiving work but it's just not happening so those are the tidbits you need to take away from preseason yeah, and touching on Mark Andrews, right, last year he was awesome down the stretch with Lamar Jackson. He was on pace for over 700 yards. But you look at the target share he got, it was like 11.4%. So if the team throws 450 times this year, which I think is pretty generous on my part given that number, that's I think 49 and a half targets on the whole season. And we chase volume, not so much efficiency. And if you're going to grab him as a top 12 tight end, I'd rather just stream the position. Yeah, he's no longer like a top 12 guy. He was He was like borderline someone that you can – you thought you'd be getting a floor out of with also like a lot of upside, but he's not on my do not draft list, but he's definitely not someone I'm comfortable starting. But back to Chris Herndon, man, uh, I know me and all the Fade the Public boys are very high on Chris Herndon. We, uh, it sucks that, you know, he's going to miss the first four games. They have a week five bye, so he's not going to be in your lineup until week six. He will likely, I mean, there'll probably be one person in each room or each draft that actually – takes Herndon and then lets him sit on um, and then lets him sit on the bench for five weeks and fuck that guy because he should be available on the waiver wire and I'll be picking him up anywhere I can and probably like week three or four because Herndon's going to be I mean he's looked so damn good with Donald this preseason and he's going to be running on every snap so Herndon to me looks like a clear top 10 tight end when he finally gets back onto the field yeah and he like low-key has some of the best hands I've seen at the tight end position he made so many one-handed grabs in contested situations last year like no metrics to back that up but just watching the guy play he's like legit good at football and you look how he was used he had the eighth most deep targets last year only two of them were catchable but down the stretch last year over the first over the last four games Sam Darnold's deep accuracy went up by 10 percent and as that rapport builds and if Chris Herndon's going to be on the field every down he's going to be a tight end that's going to pick up those chunk yards on deep plays and he was also just one red zone target off the team lead last year. He had eight red zone targets. And with them not having like a big body receiver, aside from Robbie Anderson, who weighs 
probably half as much as I do. Um, they, they don't have anybody that's going to really take away from that volume. And uh, using that, like, that player index that pro football focus or pro football reference has, just looking at rookie tight ends and how productive some of them have been and comparing it to Chris Herndon, only tight, 10 tight ends since the year 2000 have had 35 receptions and 500 receiving yards as a rookie. And Chris Herndon did that on a 55% snap share. And he kind of came out of nowhere. Like nobody expected him to be as good as he was last season. No, I wish we had fucking athletic measurables on Chris Herndon because he did not run at the combine or at the pro day. And I'm looking for like fucking fake news articles of <laughs> fucking what they clocked him at and like, the, you know, just opinions of what his 40 are. I cannot find it. I, I want to say that like he went underrated only because one, he was behind David and Joku at his time in Miami. Um, but we don't have the measurables. So it's hard to compare him to other, like if, if say he ran like a four, six, five, 40, we would all have seen this coming. We'd have been like, wow, he was an explosive athlete. Now he's in a very good spot to succeed. But the fact that we didn't have a lot of information at hand probably makes people still hesitant that they don't really know who Chris Herndon is, but we've, you know, we have enough tape, I think on him. And I think we've seen enough, from this year already in the off season to know that he's a, he's a good bet to return value once he finds his way onto your team and he's actually on the field. Yeah. And we've seen tight ends come out of nowhere and produce like George Kittle is a fifth round pick and he did absolutely nothing at Iowa. And he came out and he put up those 35 receptions and 500 yards as a rookie. And he just completely broke out last year and broke the receiving record for tight ends. And Adam Gase is a, an OC that, and now he's a coach, but he's an OC that has used his tight ends in the past. If you remember back to his time in Denver, he had Julius Thomas two years back-to-back, didn't even play a full season, double-digit touchdowns. His time in Chicago, he had Martellus Bennett, who played like 11 games but was a top-12 tight end, was on pace for like 75 targets that season. So it's a position that Adam Gase has shown to use, and I know he didn't use any in Miami, but what did he really have? Like Mike Gesicki, who can't even beat out like A.J. Derby, if that guy's even on the team anymore. He's so fucking angry that people are like – there's some people that's still high on Mike Gesicki this year. Like they think the breakout year is coming now. Yeah, every, everybody out of Penn State's breaking out this season. And the guy that you can pair Chris Herndon with over those first five weeks when he's out is a guy who I'm not too high on, but it's Greg Olson. And he's probably going to break his foot before that happens. But you look at the matchups he gets over those first five weeks, three of those teams rank top 10 and most points allowed to the tight end position. The only games where like he doesn't play like an elite matchup is against Arizona, who we've seen look terrible thus far this preseason. And the other one's against Jacksonville, but that's in week five. So you can just drop him, stream a different guy in that spot. Um, pick up Herndon and maybe another tight end and stash him. Drop the guy you picked up and then ride with Herndon week six through whatever, 16. Also, just to note, I looked it up. Uh, Herndon tore his MCL two weeks before the end of his 2017 season. So that is why he didn't run. Apparently, he would have ran a pretty good 40. He was a very athletic uh, tight end at Miami. Raw, from a talent standpoint, very similar to David and Njoku. They used him a lot as like a run after the catch kind of tight end, which is what you want from your fantasy tight end. You want someone who's athletic and can make plays after the catch because can't always rely on touchdowns from the tight end position. You don't want boomer bust. You want guys who can stack up the yards, stack up the receptions, um, and that's what makes them good plays. I think that's all we got for value plays. Yep, that's all we got today. All right, that was nice and quick and efficient. We got to the big facts. We hit you with some opinions as well. And drop that comment down below. Who was your favorite value play of 2019 fantasy football? Hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you are following us both on Twitter and you will get a lot more valuable statistical nuggets from us on there and that's all we got for you today so we will see y'all next Tuesday